So you've got supply chain bottlenecks again. The economy in China could have a great contraction. And I think that coupled with Federal Reserve tightening of monetary policy combined is really what took U.S. equities lower, not just today, but all week. Here at Liberty and Finance, we're licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. We are standing by the inventory, ready to make sure you get what you need, even into the wee hours of night and on weekends, because preparedness doesn't stop. Call us, 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And back with us today is our good friend Gary Wagner from The Gold Forecast. Gary, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure, as always. Today's been a crazy day in the markets. We saw gold and silver down quite a bit. Uh, gold ended below $1,900, silver below $23. And we see in the stock market actually about a thousand point drop in the Dow. Your take on what caused all of this, this uh, turmoil in the markets? We have to take a look at the overall picture and the upcoming FOMC meeting. And then we'll talk maybe about the, the uh, report that came out, the advance estimates for Q1, as well as the PCE today. But we've seen pressure in uh, U.S. equities for the last week, solid pressure. And I believe there's two primary causes to that. The first is the anticipation of a much more aggressive Federal Reserve. Right now, the uh, CME's FedWatch tool, which gives probability of rate hikes, is putting a 99.1% probability that next week they will announce a rate hike of the Fed funds rate of a half a percent. And then in June, a 77% probability that there will also be another half a percent rate hike. The wild card is they have alluded to beginning the tapering process or reduction process, excuse me, of their balance sheet. Of course, they concluded their tapering to zero of purchases adding to the balance sheet. But it is now swelled to what? $8.8 .8 trillion. I'd like to have just a, a millionth of that in my bank account, but a huge, huge balance sheet. When you add that to the enormous amount of aid uh, and fiscal stimulus that the US government had to go through during the pandemic and recession, that has taken our national debt sky high. And of course, that is a bullish undertone for both gold and silver, unquestionably. But the pressure we saw was the anticipation of tightening credit because businesses have gotten addicted to free money. They can do a lot of things when your borrowing costs are anywhere between zero and 1%. The wild card, of course, that's recently come up is the major lockdowns in China, as they say they're having upticks in COVID-19. Of course, most of the free world is, is pretty much past that. The light at the end of the tunnel is a light that we're looking at now. In other words, you know, we're able to move around the country and travel and, and there doesn't, it seems as we're definitely at the tail end, but we're most likely at the new normal, however that pans out. But China took a different tack. They didn't vaccinate. And there were 500 cases in Shanghai. They virtually locked that port city down, which meant that a lot of the, good, the, the goods that they export to the United States, including the necessary microchips for automobile productions and electronics, aren't coming into our ports. So you've got supply chain bottlenecks again. You've got a very, very serious problem in that the economy in China could have a great contraction. And I think that coupled with Federal Reserve tightening of monetary policy combined is really what took U.S. equities lower, not just today, but all week. And so I think those were the primary components in terms of U.S. equities. 
Do you see that the stock market could fall further from here? I know we're recording this on Friday, but it's going to be released on Saturday. So the markets are still closed. When we open up Monday, what do you think is going to happen? I, I'm not going to take a guess. Could we see a further decline? Yes. But that is going to depend on, I really think, the news that comes out of China over the weekend. If they continue to lock down more cities, they talked about locking down uh, certain parts of their capital city. In other words, if their scenario gets worse where there's a higher probability of a greater economic contraction in China, uh, then that would definitely pressure certain stocks lower. Many of these U.S. corporations have a vast percentage or at least a decent percentage of their income derived from their exporting their goods or services to China. So it will depend on that. The second thing is there's a war in Ukraine. And it's been escalating once again. The weekend seems to be a time when the market cannot react to changes in that conflict and the geopolitical uncertainty that it presents or the that that results from that war. And so come Monday in Australia and, of course, Monday in the U.S., we'll get kind of that catch up where market participants are able to react to additional news that wasn't present Friday as of now and is now present Monday next week. This is the only time the markets close. So we could see additional pressure. But I, I don't want to, to guess on whether or not it will continue to drop or it'll find support. What I can say is those are the primary variables that will influence the moves we see on Monday. And depending on how those unfold, that will determine what happens on Monday. Now, you mentioned a bit earlier that we could have seen a bottom now in both gold and silver. Silver is below $23. It's right around the low range we've been seeing for around two years now. It has been lower than this. It was twenty one fifty or so um, back in, I believe, late September, early October. And it touched that again once um, after that. But do you think we could see further to fall or is this the bottom in your view? In my view, there is a very decent probability that a bottom is in place in both gold and silver and that it will find support. Now, I'm basing this on some technical studies that I've been looking at, but fundamentally speaking, we had CPI for March come in at 8.5%, 40-year high. But today, the government released the most recent data for the PCE, and of course, that is the inflation index that the Federal Reserve uses. Um, and while it strips out food and energy costs, I, which bewilders me as to why that's the preferred um, Federal Reserve go-to inflation index, it still came in at 6.9. And what that means is that the last time we had a PC that had that kind of year-over-year -year jump was in 1980. So for the last, what, four or five months, we've been talking about inflation at a 40-year high. Well, now, according to the PC, it's at a 42-year high. So the Fed has long maintained this doctrine that it's going to peak and then it's going to begin to um, slowly diminish. And all of the data suggests the contrary. You, you know, the key right now to me is inflation. Because if inflation continues even at these levels or moves higher, as I believe it will, it's going to be hard to take the safe haven assets that are a hedge against inflation tremendously lower. Day by day, you have noise in the market. It can be up or it can be down. But on a longer term basis, as long as we have persistent inflation, which we certainly have now, there's going to be an, an underlying force that is highly supportive of both gold and silver prices. And with the war in Ukraine, which has added jet fuel to the fire, because inflationary pressures began long before the invasion, which occurred on March 24th, we really saw inflation levels pick up 
at the beginning of this year as we saw the CPI going to the sixes, then the sevens. And that was due to the end of a recession, pent up demand, and not enough supply to be able to satisfy that demand. Then you added the war in Ukraine in terms of energy costs. Those have spiraled over $100 a barrel. Russia accounts for a third, excuse me, Russia is the third largest producer and exporter of oil in the world. U.S. is number one, Saudi Arabia is number two. Secondly, in terms of food costs, and these are the two, two of the primary forces behind higher inflation. There's, there's others there, obviously. But I believe that Ukraine is the fifth largest producer of corn. And Russia, I believe, is the third largest producer of wheat. And so a lot of that wheat, of course, it's hard to, for farmers to work in Ukraine when everything's getting destroyed. And most of the, any, any of the workforce is in military uniforms. They're not going to be plowing their fields. There's boycotts against all kinds of goods in Russia. And wheat is a, a needed grain that's been exported from Russia into the European Union. So you're seeing inflationary pressures grow globally. And as long as that remains persistent, which I believe it will, it's hard to fathom gold or silver coming under tremendous pressure. It seems like what we're seeing is with the Ukraine-Russia conflict, those the resources from those countries are kind of um, off the table at the moment. And also with China, because of the shutdowns there, we're seeing less resources now coming out of there. So that will just exacerbate inflation because now other countries will have to compensate and everything will become more expensive. Is that what you're saying? Precisely, yes. We are seeing this inflation, the CPI at 8.5%, the highest in 40 years. The you know other measures of inflation somewhat lower or even somewhat higher. Um, but do you see that pretty consistent that we're going to see around 8.5 going forward for the foreseeable future? I do not believe inflation has peaked. The reason that I don't believe that to be the case is what we just spoke about. Inflation will only diminish because it is primarily based upon issues on the supply side. As the Federal Reserve and central banks globally, they're ratcheting up rates so that they can contract the demand. But when the demand is in essential goods, such as food and energy, it's hard to fathom a huge contraction of the demand. People still will eat. And when you look at things like energy costs, the primary thing we want to realize is while individual Americans or Europeans might drive less, the primary mode of moving goods from state to state or country to country in Europe is trucks. Has been and remains to be. I I believe they account for 80% of the, the, the interstate travel. And with gasoline at a record high right now, the demand is going to diminish because there's not as, there is not as much goods to ship, but whatever is available will be shipped. So I, see, I don't see inflation moving down substantially and wouldn't be surprised if it didn't continue to ratchet to higher levels. I'm also hearing out there that the FOMC or the Federal Reserve will just raise rates. You know, they are looking at a, a half point or maybe even three quarters point rate hike. And this could, you know, quell inflation. But is that going to ha- have any sort of substantial impact on inflation? The question is, I don't know. My belief is if we look back in history, to points in which we had extremely high levels of inflation. The Federal Reserve had to have a interest rate that was at least half of the level of the inflation rate to have any effect whatsoever. And typically, almost uh, two thirds as high in terms of the interest rates as the inflation to really bring it down. So will raising rates from zero, which is where Fed funds rate 
were before the first rate hike came in March and raising that to 3% to affect inflation at 8.5% have any major impact? It's simple math. I don't believe it can. I believe that it will cause a contraction in certain sectors. It will definitely affect banking and mortgages because it will price many individuals out of buying or purchasing their first home or buying a home. If interest rates move 2% higher, that's a huge difference in terms of a mortgage payment. And the way a bank qualifies you for, for your payment is your ability to pay that monthly mortgage um, payment. And a 2% difference is a big difference. But in terms of energy costs and food costs, it's going to be hard to have it affected by a, a small interest rate hike, even to 3%. I think that it was a multi-year process that got us to this level of inflation and believe it will be a multi-year process to reduce it. And that's my take. It does seem like it has been a multi-year process and more than just the supply shocks that we're seeing right now because of war and COVID, it seems like this fundamentally is more of a monetary issue. The, the Fed has created so many more dollars that they're the money in the monetary inflation is actually causing price inflation and these these other supply shocks are kind of maybe just the triggers for that, but it was going to happen all along. Absolutely. I mean, as, as we both have acknowledged, it didn't begin this year. It began when the governments and specifically the USA government allocated trillions upon trillions. I, I'm not sure if it, it, because now it's a while ago, they did four trillion I think in 2020, I believe that was followed by another, and I could be wrong about this, um, $2 trillion in 2022, and they're still trying to pass some other things now. So that's $6 million worth of additional debt. You have the uh, Fed swelling the balance sheet. I believe that they had reduced it after the 2009 recession from 4.5 trillion down to about 3.7 trillion. Then they stopped saying any more reduction would be detrimental. It would, uh, the money supply would be too illiquid. So they really, let's say they started at four and now they're up to 8.8. .8, so they've more than doubled it. The expectations, Bloomberg did a poll and they said, even if they have an aggressive move to reduce their balance sheet, they might take their, the Fed balance sheet from $8.8 trillion down to about $6.4 trillion by the end of 2024. So you're correct. It, it started years ago, but these recent blips, the supply chain bottlenecks, and specifically the current ones because of Ukraine and China, have just added additional pressure that will cause, that will make it so that inflation is much harder to, to have a solid input to begin to see a, even a peak and then a reduction. Absolutely correct. All right. Well, Gary Wagner, we really appreciate your time today. Before we let you go, any last thoughts you'd like to leave with our viewers about these crazy times we're in? And where can our viewers find you online if they're interested in learning more? Thank you for asking. First of all, thegoldforecast.com. It's one word. You can find information there. We do have a YouTube channel. Just search for The Gold Forecast. My, my final thoughts would have to be kind of not related so much to the turmoil we face and have faced, but the fact that we have to acknowledge, at least in the United States, Europe, Canada, we're at a new normal. The light at the end of the tunnel is so visible that I believe we are here. And to be greatly appreciative that we got through this really rough time. Yes, we're facing huge obstacles ahead of us, but I really believe the worst is over. At least I pray and hope it is, which leads me to my final thought, and that is 
take a moment, take a breath, the old adage, smell the roses, savor the fact that we're not worried about going to the hospital and, and having loved ones die and, and having lockdowns and all of the things that we've gone through and be appreciative of the fact that the worst, I hope and I believe, is most likely over and go out and enjoy yourself. You know, love your family, love your neighbors, take some time off, do what it takes to decompress and realize that we're, we are at a, a new normal and whatever that morphs into, let's appreciate that the, fa the fact that we are no longer dealing with as much anxiety and pressure as we were in 2020 and 21. I think it's it's amazing that we are at kind of a new normal finally, or um, we're back to normal in a lot of ways with respect to the pandemic where, you know, most of the U.S. is open up, other countries in Europe are starting to open up, and definitely we hope and pray that uh, that stays that way. So, Gary, once again, thank you so much for joining us today on Liberty and Finance. Thanks so much for having me. Miles Franklin Precious Metals is one of America's oldest and most trusted bullion dealers. Miles Franklin is A-plus rated and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, licensed and bonded, and has zero complaints ever registered. Here at Liberty and Finance, we are licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. To order, simply call us, discuss your needs, and we will let you know our live inventory, prices, and availability, and lock in your order over the phone. Once your order is locked, the price is held for you regardless of market fluctuations, and the metals are reserved for you awaiting your settled payment. Within one business day of ordering, you will receive an email invoice detailing the order and payment instructions. Miles Franklin accepts payments by bank wire, ACH or electronic check, money order, check mailed priority mail, and cryptocurrency. The fastest forms of payment are bank wire and cryptocurrency. Upon settled payment, metals will ship out within three to five business days. You will receive tracking information via email. Domestic shipping charges are $15 for any order under 500 ounces of silver or 10 ounces of gold. For orders larger than that, domestic shipping is free. The package will be double boxed, fully insured, and labeled discreetly, with no indication of the contents inside. For your privacy, the name Miles Franklin will not even be on the package. To talk to myself, Elijah, my brother Kaiser, or my father Dunnigan, call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.